Okay, all right, all right. So we're going to finish this bit about robustness, uh, which we sailed into, and then we're going to talk about a little bit more about these heavy tail distributions. We're going to add some more disappointment to the situation by saying it's not all power laws. We've already we already have the story that you know there are lots of kinds of power law size distributions, different gammas. So that's that's one thing. But we'll make it. Um, a bit worse by saying that with some small changes to the mechanisms behind things, you can get things like log normals and uh, power laws that have split, have a break in scaling, you know, all sorts of fancy beasts. Um, and they can appear, I'm just going to let that run. There you go. This is great. Fantastic. They didn't edit that out because it's awesome. <laughs> Should do it in New York somewhere. Anyway, that's good. Uh, let's see. So we we enjoyed this, the one in the million story. Okay, um, <coughs> but just to have I lost the thing? Just to recap. So we the far, this, we have this forest model. It's a terrible way of making forest. This is a um, banana cutter, actually, very important object. So, <coughs> which was given to me by a student uh, at the end of one of these courses. So, I think we've been talking about the. You know, on Amazon, the, you can see the gallon of milk, the three wolves howling at the moon t-shirt. You've seen these? They have fantastic reviews, right? And they're all linked to each other. There's the badonkadonk machine. What's that? That one has the best reviews. Okay, so there you go, right. So that's what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> one star, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Anyway, there's a, there's, yeah, there's a real, at some point, you know, these things, the, the gallon of milk too, which, I, which was at some point $2,000 or something, yeah. like the mechanism had gone wrong. Yeah. Amazon's usually pretty good, but sometimes it, you know, unavailable, 2000 What else is in there? There is a badonkadonk tank, I think, you know, your personal armor tank. Yeah, all right. <coughs> They're all connected, yeah. Okay, so we have this story about forests. We have this crazy way of building forests, but the idea is this design thing uh, where somehow uh, against some sort of uncertain background, where something bad is potentially happening. For forests, it's lightning strike or um, <coughs> squirrels with matches. And they tend to happen in some uneven way. Right? If it's completely uniform, then we, don't, we won't get anything interesting. But if there's just some uh, statistical... So, uh, sort of a dependable unevenness in the way this kind of random background is happening. You can end up with, and, and you start to design to, to, to um, prevent collapse. You do pretty well, but <coughs> you, can end, you can end up with a system that generally is fine, but now and then will explode. Right? So it's a, you know, doesn't exactly explain death stars. That's, that's a story issue. But um, <coughs> that's not a bad, it's a paradigmatic example. Okay. So I want to, I've mentioned percolation a little bit. I, I'll just have it here again. I'll give you some questions about this and then not the next, kind of a bit out of order, but the, an assignment that comes later. It's something I didn't want to go on <coughs> about too much. This could be a whole, all of these things could be the, a whole, you know, course. But it's a, it's a pretty famous uh, study in, uh, oh yeah, all right, that's okay. In uh, uh, statistical mechanics and physics, very simple thing, so here's the idea. I mean, it is actually our forest story, but um, it, we can see it as this percolation business. Okay, I think we do. So we're gonna randomly add trees. So there's, there's a, in a sense testing, but there's really no testing. So you're just randomly adding trees, and we saw that we ended up with this kind of pretty modeled looking forest story, and it's dangerous, right? It, 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 it doesn't get very dense before you start to uh, get forest fires that um, start to be really quite big on average. Uh, and we saw it was around about a half, actually. When the density is about a half, it starts to get bad. Because you've got enough connections of trees. Uh, the trees are connected, so you can actually start to see it as a giant, what we call a giant component. Uh, and the word is percolation, right? So below some density, so this is a very typical thing. Lots of different ways of doing percolation. Put them on different lattices. You can have two dimensions, three dimensions. You can put on networks. We'll get to networks. You can have lots of fun with this. Some things can be exactly solved, and that is exciting for physicists, but no one else. Um, and anyway, actually, the lattice can matter, which is a bit of a 
bit of an issue. Let's see. So uh, this, this is idea of a critical density. And this, so this also connects very much to contagion, right? So spreading, big deal. Ebola is a thing that we're at least spreading. It's definitely spreading. It's a terrible thing. And, uh, you know, of course, we're spreading information about it on top. So uh, there are models of disease that we'll get to later on that are exactly the kind of have this story. All right. So let's see. So, um, so you add enough trees at some point, some critical density, you start to have big enough components and clusters that, if a, uh, that, that you'll, you'll get these <coughs> macroscopic burns, these forests that are macroscopic and they'll all burn. Now, the thing that happens is only at this critical density do you get a parallel size distribution of forest fires. So this is a very important point. Right, so let's see. So here's, here's the... the <coughs> density of trees that you're putting down, zero to one. Turns out there's a critical threshold, and we're just random, this is only for the random case, we're randomly adding. So this is the average fire, let's make it the average fire size, which I think was cost. Well, this is not yield. Uh, so eventually when it's one, when the whole thing is, this is normalized, when, the, when the, you've put trees everywhere, everything burns, right? So it's bad. So it's got to end up here, and it has this kind of thing. So it's a, it's a classic, phase transition story. Below, you're getting tiny little fires, tiny little fires, and when N is large enough, you know, it's a big enough uh, grid, you never see them, right? You never see them macroscopically. But at this point, this critical threshold, uh, you start to see, on average, large ones. And it, but the thing is, it's only at this point that you see, let me see if I can draw this. So the distribution of forest fires is like this here. It's a little exponential, say. Right, so lots of small ones, and here's say one. Uh, out here, you're going to get this sort of thing. You get lots of small ones still, but you get a big one, right? Because you're going to have a far <coughs> like this. This thing here could be your forest, right? And then there's some big heap of trees that are all connected, maybe sort of a fractal boundary. But if you're missing it, nothing. You know, you get tiny little fires. But if you hit this thing, it goes and burns, and it doesn't matter where you hit it. It's always going to be the same size. So you get a spike here. You get a characteristic size. There's one big kind of size of fire. Uh, but it's only at this point where you get, and this is going to be on a log-log plot, you get a parallel size distribution of forest fires. So it's a very special point. You know, measure zero is right there. You have to have the system tuned to that point. So that's going to matter as we... Um, <coughs> Talk about different things. All right, so, so is that sort of okay? It's just I know it's a thing. We're throwing the idea out there. Uh, very much true that the for these forests, if we're going to make them this way, they're featureless and random, um, random in, in structure. And what we saw is if you put just some design in there, which for this m simple model is how many choices of where you can place the trees as you build it. We have d equals two, d equals n, and d equals n squared. You get a much more structured looking thing, which we will call a low entropy system very unusual system. Okay, and that's what these things are, the highly optimized tolerance forests, the, the hot forests, very structured. You get a parallel size distribution of tree sizes and forest fires, so not just at this point, but all out here. That was the big deal. It can, this, it's a much more kind of forgiving kind of model. You don't have to have a special thing that's saying your density must be here, like the, the nature is putting the density here. Right, so there isn't a special, nobody is special, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, there isn't a specialness of, of, the, of this critical density. Most states are, the, the states are tolerant most of the time, nothing bad happens. Now and then something a little worse happens and then you know, if you wait long enough you get something even worse and if you wait much, much longer or you're really unlucky, it goes boom, boom. Okay, um, so it's okay if you've got your uncertainty well cut, right? If you know where the sparks are, where the where these squirrels <coughs> with, with the matches are, um, <coughs> they play against Smokey. Smokey's um, <coughs> different cartoon. Okay, so we have uh, if 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 you don't if you don't know where the squirrels are, you're in a lot of trouble, right? Because uh, you've car you've built the thing in the wrong way, and it's not going to fit. So if we had our uh, example from the other day, if we change the distribution, we move all the sparks over into the place where we had this huge forest area, uh, then the whole thing can explode. Okay. 
Yes. So if someone figures out how to drop those proton things into it. Right. Yeah. Most of the time that doesn't happen. Okay. All right. Uh, you can, so, so I'll, I'll just, I'm going to just touch on these things. I'll give you a couple of calculations to work through. Uh, this is a nut. This is from this PNAS paper, which I would suggest you read, actually. It's, it's you know, a, sort of a general piece. Pretty interesting. If this is of interest to you, you know, if you have a system that you're worried about uh, having integrity, which applies to most of them, um, <coughs> unless you're trying to blow it up, then that's, I guess it's also interesting. All right, so... Uh, so we have some constraint. Um, in this case, there's, there's, there's some resource that you're allocating. These are different things. So this is actually data compression, uh, packets on the World Wide Web. These are, these are two types of forest fires here. And the, the constraint thing is natural for these guys. It's building and maintaining breaks, fire breaks. Right? There's only so, I mean, you could knock the whole forest down. That's good, but you don't want to do that. No more fires. Not optimal, but if you're given some limit to how much you can, uh, you, can you can cut and maintain, then uh, that's, that's cool. All right, so let's have a little kind of abstract argument for how this might work, again, with forest fires. Um, and we'll see how these things we've had before, the, the um, transformation of variables where we have a <laughs> parallel relationship and uh, is, is going to be doing the job. And it's going to be doing, uh, it'll be to do with dimensions. Um, in that, again, forest fires are 2D things and the boundaries are one-dimensional, right? So we're putting one-dimensional boundaries around things. So it's going to be that connection there. All right, so um, failure size is going to be Y, right? So that's the size of a forest fire. And there's some resource size X. And so that's the length of the boundary, for example, around a particular forest that you're maintaining, right? You have to go out and keep it um, clear. And there's, we'll see that the, if, if we have a connection between those, and now we're not just talking about forests, we're talking about things in general, that the, the, how much the thing explodes, the cost of it is um, proportional to uh, the, the resource required to, to look after that region. Um, in this way, with some inverse power relationship, then we'll get our power law size distribution, which we totally want. All right. Um, so of course you want to minimize your explosiveness of the thing, how much it goes bang. So that's, that's the goal. We're going to minimize this. So we're going to have one of these constraint things again, which keep popping up. They can go away, but we'll, we've had a few of them. Uh, so we have some cost. It's a probably that we get, that we have uh, um, a, 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 a cost of Y times the cost. Right. C, y went to C. That's okay. And we're going to sum over all the sites, right? So we imagine we have, this is a discretized version. You can do continuous ones. So we imagine we, you know, we partition it a lot, which is uh, good for computers. And then there's some constraint. There's a constraint, there's a resource associated with each site. And it may be that it's like this. All right, so imagine you've got, so it could be that you've got your forests here. There's, you're going to build uh, your your breaks like this, some strange way. You've got your trees in here. And then we're just going to grid the whole thing. And this is, say, the ith, this is the ith site here. It's associated with this boundary here. And that's the, the cost to look after this guy is distributed amongst all of its um, uh, colleagues that are in the same uh, region. So you can think about it that way. So we're going to sum up the sum cost for each one. Uh, and it, again, we you know appealing to the fire story. Uh, you have some limited uh, boundary that you can put down, right? You can put these lines down. You want to close off the, the most dangerous pieces, and you'll let it kind of go when you get out to the least dangerous areas, the ones with the density of uh, the probability of sparks being lowest. So it, it, it's quite reasonable. Um, I mean, it should appeal to you at least through that. Uh, one particular example. But again, it's more generalizable. All right, so let's do it for fires. So the cost of a fire, um, we have to think about how we structure this. All right, so there's some, er there's some area. There's a bit of non-locality in here. So the area of this thing is A sub I, right? And let's say this is I plus one as well. Then <coughs> all of these guys have the same area associated with them. It's the area of the region they're in. So it's a non-local thing. Can they have that? 
And they have the average probability that someone in here gets hit. One of the trees gets hit. Uh, so these things give you, the, this, this product here gives you the probability that a spark lands in that whole region. The problem is we're going from sites to regions as well. But we're going to do our sum over sites. That's exciting. Uh, we are multiplied by the area, because this is the actual cost. Right? So we've got probability times cost. We, this is an average of cost. And so that's just simply the probability of a, this average probability of a fire at site in the um, ith, uh, the, at the ith site. Uh, it, uh, sorry, the region of the ith site. Okay, okay. So that's, that's going up with area. So cost, it makes sense, it's good. Uh, and then we're gonna appeal to some kind of little hand wavy stuff. Uh, so the cost of the firewalls well, okay. So these things aren't necessarily circles or anything, or, right? But they're not growing in what we'll see later on as an allometric way. Uh, so what's the, what's the boundary? So if we've got all these little regions, they're getting bigger, right? So this is A1, say, A2, A3. Um, and then there's a boundary associated with them. And the idea is that that's scaling. This is called, call this the boundary. Uh, length, perimeter, I guess we could use that very well defined word. The, this is uh, scaling as A to the half. So meters, meters squared to the half, right? right? If we had circles, um, radius is scaling as the square root of pi r squared. Right, so if we're in three dimensions, then we'll have a, a the boundary will be scaling as, well, what, what will it be scaling as? So we've got a surface around a volume. So the, the barriers are going to be surfaces, right? You, so if something explodes in this volume, it goes to, the, to that sack and then can't get out. So how, do, how does it scale in that, in, in that dimension? Two thirds. Two thirds, all right. So in general, it's D over D, uh, D minus one over D. Um, good. So, because the length scale is scaling as the volume, the d-dimensional volume to, a, to 1 over d, and then to get up to the surface, you have to raise it to a power of d minus 1. Good. All right, so this is in general d minus 1 over d, but it's going to be um, a to the half. So this is a, this is a proportionality. All these, surf, all these little shapes are, you know, they're not exactly the same shape, but this is a rough thing to say. Uh, this 1 over a here is because um, we're still... We're still summing over the sites. We're moving across the sites. This is stuff. I know it's, it's confusing. You're moving across the sites. So each site gets one piece of this. Right. This is the total for the whole region. And then each site is going to bear this much cost. You have to divide it by that area. Um, OK. So, e so, it's, so, so, that's, so, these, that's, that's, so you see the tension here is, in fact, so it's the whole thing is area to the minus a half. So it's bigger. It's better to have an enormous amount of trees. You know, it's, you, know, you want to build a bigger forest. That's good. But the problem is, it depends on this probability here. But it can go the other. It goes the other way here, right? Things explode horribly. Right. So in terms of, yeah, you don't you don't want to put little fire breaks everywhere. If you can let it go looser and looser, then you will. So we're assuming a kind of isometry. We'll come back to these words later, later on when we study scaling, which is a big, big deal. Um, good, it's sitting there. Uh, and so you can actually figure this out, right? You can figure this out. Again, we get a power law. We'll get a little minus gamma business here. And I hope I have this right. Two plus one over D. So in this case, D equals two. So we get a five halves area to the minus five halves, which is one of these interesting scalings, right? It's between two and three, so it's a very large variance, very small mean, a relatively small mean. So most of the time the fires are small in this made up example. Now and then they're bigger and bigger and bigger, and now and then they explode. So it's a nasty distribution. <coughs> Statistics of surprise. Okay, so you guys can work through that. Um, okay, so I'll have another piece. <coughs> Let's do that. <coughs> oh, you know what, I think I have to <coughs> Just watch this, it really is good. Okay, all right. <laughs>
You can be quiet. <coughs> we'll go look. So this is, a, this is a different kind of problem with Star Wars. It's probably a little rude. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so I threw the Senate at him. <laughs> the whole Senate. True story. Oh my God, that is so funny. You made it come out of my nose. <laughs> Go for Papa Palpatine. You have a collect call from... Oh, I, I gotta take this. Hold on. Vader, how's my favorite Sith? Whoa, 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 whoa. Just slow down. Huh? What do you mean they blew up the Death Star? Oh! Who's they? What the hell is an aluminum falcon? Okay, okay, so, so who's left? Sir. Are you me? Well, where are you? Wait a sec, you've been flying around for two weeks trying to get a signal? Oh, you must smell like feet wrapped in leathery burnt bacon. Oh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I thought my Dark Lord of the Sith could protect a small thermal exhaust port that's only two meters wide. That thing wasn't even fully paid off yet. Do you have, do you have any idea what this is going to do to my credit? Oh, hang on, I got another call. What? I'm very busy right now. Oh, oh, well, well where are they going? Huh. All right, um, just get me a turkey club. Uh, coleslaw, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to eat it. What, what, what are you getting? Yeah, see, I, I always order the wrong thing. No, 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 I'll just stick with that. Okay, bye. Wait, what? Oh, uh, cherry coke. Thanks. Sorry about that. What? Oh, oh, just rebuild it? Oh, that a real, real f***ing original. And who's going to give me a loan, jackhole? You? Do you get an ATM on that torso light bright? Now get your seven foot two asthmatic ass back here, or I'm gonna tell everyone what a whiny bitch you were about Patamame or Panda Bear or whatever the hell her name is. <laughs> oh jeez, he's crying. <laughs> hey, 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 come on, come on, don't do that. Just, just, uh, look, I, you know, I'm just dealing with a lot of crap right now. Death Star blown up by a bunch of f***ing teenagers, you know, I didn't mean to snap. I'll, I'll, I'll ju just get back here. Okay. Okay. Bye. I. Yeah. I. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's very rude. Um, but yeah, it's thematically adjacent. Okay. <coughs> we have one more of those. Okay. So <coughs> it becomes increasingly unhinged. All right. So. All right, so, the, so it's a, this hot thing is a good story. This high level of tolerance is a good story. All right, it seems to work pretty well. There are some debates about it, um, of course, and um, so we'll see what happens in the end. But it's got a lot, uh, you know, a lot, of, lot of good features to it. This, it's a robust theory as well, okay, in some ways, ironically. But it, it, the fact that there isn't this kind of exact structure that you have to have, it's pretty... Um, Relaxed. All right, so this is the thing to contrast. This, this comes much earlier. It's a uh, work that first <coughs> appeared in 987. Did I get that right? 987. So it's uh, Bach, Per Bach, who's not around anymore. He's a Dutch uh, scientist. Um, Danish, I'm terribly sorry. A Danish scientist. Okay, so th here's, here's this idea. It's a, it, was, it was this example of a system that could produce power law size distributions for free. And the idea is that somehow tuning, we had this example before um, where there was a critical point and you had to be right there. So it's the idea that there's a tuning by nature, by the system itself, to bring it back, to bring it to this point where the magic happens. So it's a very special kind of system. This is what it was. So, the, so it's a model, and I've seen, I've seen years ago in Corsica, of all places, I saw this incredible argument between engineers and physicists about this because they, they all hated it. So it turns out sand piles are somewhat interesting things. They're a bit strange, right? So, and it, and the, the, the bigger thing here is granular media, which is really di a difficult business and it's huge. I mean, food, there's so many food, that, like ri this is rice, for example. You know, you're moving stuff from one place to another, moving grains. They don't flow, sometimes they flow, sometimes they don't. So you can use a lot of fluid mechanics in some cases, but it breaks down in other ways. So, you know, fluid, fluid mechanics is one of our great successes, of course, in terms of understanding a complex system. 
But granular media remains this, this difficult business. All right, so, uh, you know, for example, I mean, one of the great, one of the classic examples of silos, right? So if you fill up a silo with wheat, it's filling up, filling up, filling up. If you filled up, if, if this was filled with water, the pressure on the bottom would just increase linearly with the height of the, uh, the column. But what happens is because the, the way the grains um, are connected with each other, you get these kind of uh, almost, you get these kind of fractal-like jagged um, force, uh, what do they call them, force paths in them. And pressure starts to build up on the sides. And so silos can split because it's a very strange kind of property. It shouldn't really be pushing there. You wouldn't expect it. But you get these force chains. That's what's happening, force chains. And they start to really push more and more on the side. So all of this up here might be being supported by the walls, you know, right? So in fact, this part here is not holding up anything. All of these grains, you know, which are pushing on the bottom and these sides can be like this. And it, it's true that you can open up the bottom of a silo. I grew up on a wheat farm. You grow, open up the bottom of a silo and um, wheat can come out, or more trivially, possibly with your Cheerios, and, and nothing, you know, it gets stuck. Like, that's it. It's not going to flow anymore. And you have to, like, hit it. And bad things happen if you, you know, try to, you know, get in there and get it out. Um, <laughs> so you don't, humans are not very smart. So you don't do that. You, you don't do that. Um, okay, there's that example. So another one is this, here's the crazy idea. So we have a little sand pile and we're just going to drop sand from, from a, well, we we'll probably have a graduate student up here, but we'll have something, <laughs> right? Let's, let's put a conveyor belt. Graduate student is playing Tetris. It's okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> have a good day. All right, so it's going to fall down. And so you start with, you get a little mound and it builds up, it builds up. And in, in uh, geomorphology, you talk about an angle of repose which is that, depending on the material, there's some steepness at which the thing will start to avalanche. Fair enough, right? So you start to get avalanches, and it cascades down. Maybe it's a tiny little trickle. Maybe you get a bigger one. The claim is that these things produce uh, parallel size distributions. And then that it's emblematic of this thing that's become known as self-organized criticality. So a couple of features, and I'll say them again. It's driven, right? So here's your system that's being driven. Material is being taken out, so there's sort of a, you know, there's a flux in and out. Uh, there are complications of, there was all these arguments about whether the force, and it's like this, the force is not, the force distribution on the bottom, on the plate, the pressure distribution, um, has sort of a hollow in the middle. It's adjacent to this, I guess. Uh, so it turns out, so, all right, so this is the inspiration. It's just sort of a story, really. And then there's a model made by these guys where they drop, not, of course, grains of sand, because we're going to go to a computer, so we drop blocks. It's a really bad game of Tetris. We're going to drop these blocks down one at a time. Your uh, Commodore 64 is probably going to do this, 1987, or your Mac 2E, something like that. And uh, <coughs> what's going to happen is we'll get this little carpet of blocks. And if we get a stack of blocks that's uh, height three, and then another one lands on top. Okay, so what's gonna happen visually from the top, if this gets to a height four, then they jump, do a weird thing. They go like this, and they go plus one here, plus one here, plus one here, plus one here. So it's a kind of, a, this is supposed to be a mechanism that copies this. So really what it is is some kind of weird carpet thing. So you're dropping it down, nothing gets above a height of four, if there was a three here, it now becomes four, and it does the same thing. So it's sort of a more of a domino-y looking thing. Um, and it's kind of strange, right? This, if there's a three here, this one hops on top of it, and it would hop on top of this one, and it would hop on top of this one. So it's, a, it's very stylized. It doesn't build anything that looks like a sandpot. So the claim is that this guy produces these parallel size distributions, and this was this famous paper. Um, you know, so that's debated as to whether it does exactly, and so on and so on. Uh, it turns out that real sand doesn't do this. No one was able to produce this with real sand. It was just sort of a story. So people tried all sorts of things. And then our Norwegians, while well, they're not on trains, um, <laughs> got uh, some, of them, some of them organized themselves to do this. Uh, these, this is actually a long grain rice between two plexi plexiglass, um, uh, two plates of plexiglass. So it's a 2D version, not a 3D version. And this is, I think, to my knowledge, the only one that produces uh, avalanches of parallel size distribution. So 
they had a little thing putting the putting the grains in it, a regular thing. The, there was a graduate student had to sit here and um, count the sizes. Yeah, you could automate that, but I think that was a sleep deprivation exercise. Anyway, this was debated because they're like, no, we don't believe you, but uh, apparently it does work. All right, so all right, bit of a fun. So this is a bit of a it's a funny history, but you self-organized criticality is talked about a lot. There certainly are self-organizing systems, and there may be ones where this is really a, a good thing. I don't know. But in terms of the history of all of this, uh, this has been a bit of a funny detour or path you know, where the monks have, monks have like run into this path and maybe, that, maybe they need to all pull out. Okay, so let's see. So the idea is that, as I was saying, you, you, there are just in many systems you have this phase transition and somehow natural systems push you to these, get pushed back to these things. There's some sort of way of them being... Um, relaxing back to them in some strange way. So we've talked, we've mentioned the Ising model came up the other day. So you can imagine the Ising model with, which is, which is magnets. It's a model of magnets, and I'll talk about it again later, uh, where, where it's very, again, you can put on all sorts of grids, and you can put in one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, you can have all sorts of fun with this. But it turns out to model real magnets quite well. Um, it's completely made up, of course, right? Which is, which is so that each little, uh, Location can have a spin up or a spin down, and I'll talk about it again later on. And that the one spins next to each other like to be pointing in the same direction. And it depends on the temperature. The higher the temperature, the less they care about each other. The colder it is, the more they want to be in alignment. Um, and that gives rise to a phase transition. So the idea is, if you know about this thing, I'll mention it again later on, it would be the same thing as saying, oh, for some reason we get back to the, this critical point where suddenly this system is beginning showing magnet, like an overall level of magnetism. Or somehow water tunes itself to be right at the transition between ice and water. That would be another example, right? That's another very famous phase transition. So somehow you're getting this kind of for free. It's just sort of built into the way things work. So it's uh, Bach, Tang, and Weisenfeld. This is, again, as I said, 1987. Um, they were looking at another aspect that we don't really discuss here, but one over F noise. Uh, and the problem is that, yeah, this critical stage of, is this tiny point. You have to be right there to get your power law size distribution. So it's appealing. I mean, really what's happened is you've got physicists saying, oh, we get power laws. I mean, they happen right here. So maybe the real world produces that. And I mentioned this the other day. In the, in the physics literature, these became known as critical states because you're going from you know, one kind of phase to another. You're going from, if you like, water to ice. So it's a critical point. Um, uh, so it's not clear that you can always, you know, that self-tuning is, is a real thing. Uh, and, and just, yeah, the term criticality sounds fantastic. So it, it, it got a lot of, a, I, think it, I think that helped it as much as anything. Branding is a big issue. So lots of criticism, lot, lot, lots of arguing, particularly ultimately by the hot uh, champions. Perbach was definitely an ambitious character. Uh, he had a book called How Nature Works. <laughs> Boom, that's it. I don't even know if it had a, you know, usually it's like, okay, you know, it's called on the science of self-organized self criticality. So, um, <coughs> but you can see in here, this is, this is actually a sand dunes, which you know, sort of a similar business there. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a you know, this is a kind of a great work, but um, I don't think it quite holds together. So let's compare these things. We both have power laws coming out of heart and sock. Uh, one is an optimization story, the other one is a supposed self-tuning. We have this nice feature for the hot models is that you can have all sorts of densities of system producing power law size distributions. There's a very special density for SOC. Uh, and hot gives these, <coughs> these structures, these low entropy structures that, that um, match the, the environment that they're living in. And the SOC ones produce so-called generic ones, or randomized ones, right? They're messy, they're random ones. Like the icing model never has anything that you can see from a, a distance. I'll give you, I'll show you that later on. We'll show you that later on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, again, this is from this paper that you might enjoy reading. Uh, lots of different pieces in here. This is SOC, <laughs> hot and data, you know, hot and reality is what this is, what this column says. <laughs> My theory, your theory. My theory is better than yours. Um, you know, you can compare all these things. We've mentioned some of them. 
right? So they're, they're very structured versus generic. It's got the robust yet fragile story going on. Uh, you can have high density with, with low yield. Um, the maximum event size is true, is, is always small in these cases, but it can be large here. All right, lots of, lots of pieces, okay. And of course, one is, you know, has this nice plausible design story. All right, okay, that's the paper. You can uh, dig into it, a lot of things, you know, things about Boeing 747s and that sort of stuff, all right? Okay, all right, last little piece is cold theory, so we're very funny, so we have hot theory, so we have someone better have, that should have been tepid. Anyway, so let's have cold theory, constrained optimization with limited deviations. How long did it take him to get this one? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, and then should they have, oh, look at that, there it is. Oh, Michelle Govan. Actually, so Michelle Govan was a, a student of mine in a, um, in a uh, 1803 at MIT. It was a differential equations. I was a recitation instructor. She was a random student who went on to do all sorts of interesting things. Anyway, so Newman, side point. Uh, Don Farmer is very famous in chaos and then uh, uh, finance theory. Uh, where's my thing? I don't know why my little, this little guy doesn't, ooh. Damn you, damn you. Uh, so that's 2002, is that right? Wow, PRL, best, journal, best physics journal in the world. Um, okay, good for them. I, I mean, it's quite a reasonable idea. All right, so the idea is, so I don't know, a couple of years, three or four years. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah, could have been just a tweet, right? No, but it's a serious piece of work. So, uh, so simple thing, you can just disproportionately weight the costs of, of things. So instead of saying, you know, in, in these little calculations you're <coughs> gonna do, um, we had something like, you know, the, the cost is just proportional to the area that gets burned. You could say, well, let's make it area to some power. And so you could do it in two ways, right? It could be area to the power of a half, which means you don't, yeah, it's not so bad. If it's area squared, it means that you're really, really worried about, you know, these big things blowing up. Uh, so you just introduce an exponent there. Uh, it does two things. One is the average, the average um, burn size gets larger because you're giving up a little bit, right? So you're starting to say, uh, I don't really have a picture, so I'll make one. So instead of, instead of this kind of, this structure we had before, let's say it was like this, right? And you leave this open, this possibility for the, someone to do something with collateralized debt obligations and go, right? Um, I'm totally making that up. Uh, and you let this, this starts to stretch out a little bit. So not so bad, but you're gonna, you're gonna give up something back here, right? These guys are gonna, there's gonna be a bigger, uh, explosion back here, slightly bigger. So your average burn size gets bigger. Um, but you can effectively truncate the, the end of the thing. So you, you can actually will produce power loss size distributions that are multiplied by exponentials that go and stop. So you can limit the, the disaster. So it's a, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice uh, extension of it. And of course, it has a, an acronym. Um, <coughs> And you can get these sorts of things, right? So this is a typical form. You actually see this comes out analytically in a lot of structures. So here's our power law. And then it's multiplied by an exponential, which you think might just crush it to pieces. But if this xc is very, very large, then this is one for a long time, right? If x is much smaller than xc, right? If this thing is 10,000 and you've got x is one, this is basically just, right? That's basically zero, this is one. So for a long time, that exponential is really not doing anything, even though it looks like this. So it looks like a power law and then drops off. And visually, uh, I want to take away my blocks. Visually, it's going to look like, uh, instead of a power law like that, it's going to start to look like, it's going to just drop off. Yeah. So it's an important thing you need to see. Um, <laughs> all right, whatever. Oops. Oops. Okay, that's good. You can have Weibull distributions, lots of other things. Um, okay. 
Is that thing dead? It just turned green. Okay. Bad. All right. Bad robot. Okay. <laughs> so we can come to this later on. Uh, I think we will, yeah, when we talk about complex networks, it's a paper from 2000. It's a pretty simple story. You know, you have these different kinds of networks. What happens if you try to attack one randomly? What happens if you try to attack it in a targeted way? And the, target, the targeting is pretty simple. Um, you just go for the, one, the, the node with the most frames. All right. So you can think about what might happen there. Uh, but again, a robust yet fragile sort of story, right? So you can have networks that uh, random attacks fail on, but targeted ones are very successful. Yeah. And it's, it's a simple story, but you know, if you're trying to take out a giant uh, part of the internet or, uh, right, because it's really well connected, like part of the backbone of the internet, it's going to be much harder than taking out, you know, a connection in the wall in my office. Um, or, you know, if you want to go to the web, you know, if you want to remove Google, like take Google down, that's going to be much, much harder than taking out UVM, say, or, again, my computer. Um, <laughs> uh, which they've probably been owned for years and years. Okay, Hello, one more. the elevator. I remember this. What's your ID number? It's 1142. Keep ass. I'm very sorry. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get the next one. Plenty of room. Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll just take the escalator. Please on in. I'd, I'd rather my robes didn't smell like a f fillet of fish all day. <laughs> That's helpful, man. Well, next time, just let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Sorry. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Yep. My lord. Uh-huh. My lord. No. My lord. Mm. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Stormtrooper. My lord. Stormtrooper. Stormtrooper! 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 My lord! Yes. My lord! Go yourself! My lord! Go yourself! My lord! Go yourself! My lord! Go yourself! What the? All right. <laughs> We're good. So yeah, people are robust yet fragile, as well. Especially Sith Lords. Okay. The big bad usually tends, you know, they tend to lose it at some point. Uh, that's part of the narrative. Okay, so, I'm sorry. It's Seth MacFarlane too, isn't it? He's just a terrible character. Um, anyway, I like stop animation. Uh, let's see, so, uh, okay, log normals, train. I'm still going. It's good. Um... Log normals. Okay, so let's talk about these guys. We can kind of zip through this. <coughs> I'd love to get up to the next bit. But I don't know. All right, let's see. Okay. All right. Power law size distributions. Too much. We've done it a lot. Yep. But they are everywhere and they're a big deal. And so you now you have a couple of big story kind of mechanisms, right? And really Simon's model is the, is the one. We'll see it appears again in um, networks. So it's sort of one of, it, it, I mean, it's arguably sort of the, the big mechanism. It's the big, one, one from which many others can be derived or, or seem to be associated with. Lots of other mechanisms give rise to power law size distributions, but and that's, that's important to know. And then some give rise to distributions that are similar to, but aren't power law size distributions. So this is another source of trauma. Okay. All right, so. Um, <coughs> This guy here is the log normal distribution, hyphen is optional. Uh, you can see you've got all your good uh, normal behavior, the whole root 2 pi business. It's, well, I'll we'll get the transform in a little bit, but you end up the, with the 1 over x out the front and of course the log x up here. And it's written in this way where we, kinda, we have the underlying mu and sigma of the normal. It's a bit, it's a bit odd, but this has been the standard. Uh, another one is the Weibull distribution. Uh, that collapses to when mu equals 1, this goes away, and e to the minus x. So it's a kind of a, you can see then you get a family around the exponential distributions. 
And if you look at this, you can see, all right, there's an e to the minus x thing here, but there's a parallel piece here. Loving the parallels, right? So you can have a parallel decay truncated with an exponential. Uh, and that's really, you'll, you'll hear, maybe you'll see the, the term stretch exponential, gamma distributions. These are things that can have heavier tails. Obviously, when you have an exponential, pure exponential, not a heavy tail. But as you move away, when mu is not equal to 1, you start to get something that looks like that. All right. Mu less than 1. All right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. So, log normal. Let's focus on this guy. So, I just want to show you a couple of hairy, horrible things. Let's do that. Just so you don't go out and think everything is a parallel. Uh, so, the story is log x is distributed log this variable, log x is distributed as a normal, is distributed normally and it has mean mu and variance sigma. Um, you see it all over the place actually and it's, it appears predominantly in, in uh, describing uh, quantities that are explicitly positive, right? So, well money's, wealth is a bit funny because it can go negative, but, um, but let's say money under the bed and um, actual money Biology, things are growing, things are of different sizes, population numbers, sizes of things. Um, that, that can be the case. You can't have a you know, negative kilograms. All right. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about this guy. It's a pretty cool thing. And then we'll get a very simple mechanism for producing it. And we'll show some horrible things about it. Okay. Right, so this is the business. If you go through and now actually calculate the mean and the median, and this is the, the standard deviation and the mode, you can see they're, they're, how they're built out of the underlying normal distribution, right? The normal distribution applies to the quantity log x. So, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's exponentiated. Mu, of course, can be negative. Mu can be negative, so this can be dialed up and down. The median should make sense. You're taking the log of this quantity, so exponentially it puts it, um, right, so you have a, I guess I don't have a, an example. It depends on the parameters, but log normals tend to look, you can see them, right? They, 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 you, you can certainly choose parameters so they're, they're sort of seeable. They have a tail, and of course normals are symmetric, uh, but this point is matching up with this point. Modes, we like the mode. Um, that's not right. The median, the median is here, which is exactly halfway, which is the same as the mode. And it depends, uh, it's gonna depend. It's gonna depend, it's probably, yeah, more like this. Right, so the mode, the, the peak is actually further back. All right, a few little pieces. Uh, very different to parallel size distributions, like pure ones where we have infinite moments above some you know, for, for moments, we've figured this out for moments, depending on gamma, for moments of uh, ab above a certain value, right? Everything is infinite. Uh, and, right, good. So there's some features. So let's just, let's just connect it to the normal distribution. Um, <coughs> that's a good thing to do. So imagine we have Y distributed normally, right? So here's our classic... Uh, distribution, and we're going to set y equal to log x, right? So y is now, so log x is distributed normally. So it's a transformation of variables story. We get p of x dx from p of y dy, and so we take, we've got y equals log x, so dy dx is 1 over x, and so we can put a little dx over here, so dy is dx uh, um, divided by x. So we're going to replace this guy by dx over x, and we're simply going to replace the only y in here with log x. So that's where we got this original form. So p of x dx, this is very exciting, I know. p of x dx looks just like a normal except we've put our log x in there for y. And the Jacobian, the little transformation, popped a 1 over x in here. So that 1 over x is the sneaky business. It's kind of giving, it's got, we, we have an x to the minus 1 out the front. And we know log x glow, grows slowly, so you can see it might look like this. It could look like there are, okay, let's get to the next part. Here's an example where you have a pure power law, gamma equals one with some prefactor, uh, a log normal, which has an underlying distribution, uh, normal distribution of mu equals zero, sigma equals 10. 
And they look pretty similar, right? So the red one is the parallel, which is a perfect straight line on this graph. You can see it's starting to deviate here. Um, but if you're just you know, rampaging in and you're going to do some regression, and you say, so this, is, this, this has happened a lot, where people come in and say they've got a power law size distribution, and it's because of this thing, and it's a glorious universal story. And then someone publishes a paper later on saying you, you, you're very silly, and it's a log normal, and they're pretty boring. Log normals have a very, they have one mechanism. Essentially, well, kind of, right? <coughs> which isn't super exciting, right? The central limit theorem is not, it's a beautiful thing, but it's not super exciting. You haven't discovered this great new law of the universe, which is what everyone wants to do. Uh, so let's uh, unpack this guy. So we've got our P of X, we're gonna take log of both sides because we know we're gonna put this in a log log plot. Let's just deal with this. We've got a piece at the front, which will be, so that's gonna be this one over X becomes minus log X. There's a minus log root two pi sigma, that's this guy, and then this is all exponentiated, so everything just comes down. So you can see the log x is gonna be here, and we're gonna get a power of log x, I mean, a square, the square of log x, so that's this beast. So log x squared divided by two sigma squared, with a minus sign, that's this guy. And then we're gonna collect some terms, there's a minus one here, and if you, the cross term here is two log x times mu, or two mu times log x, you cancel the twos, so mu over sigma squared, we'll put those together. And then these are constants, right? They just have mu's and sigma's in them. So if this term is small, so the variance is large and it's kind of crushing this, uh, then it really looks like this piece. So you have log px looks like some multiple of log nx. And that's, a, that's what we get on a, for a perfect power law. Uh, so it's gonna look like this. Log of px is minus whatever this guy is, so that's our gamma. That, that would be our measure of gamma. One minus mu over sigma squared. So that's kind of bad, mm -hmm. because you can choose all sorts of mu's and sigma's. You could create any gamma you want. And until this term takes over, eventually it is going to tank. There is an end to this distribution. Until this term takes over, it's going to look like a power <coughs> You have to think a little bit about uh, what it means to have a positive or negative mean. Variance is fine, some variance, uh, when it comes to the growth model. And I'm going to say that mu equals zero is a pretty natural one, which corresponds to gamma equals one, which is a pretty weird extreme power law. But we'll get to that. Um, <coughs> right, let's look, at, let's look at what we have. So we can't have gamma less than one. We can't have gamma less than one. That's bad. It's an unnormalizable distribution. That's one of the first things we looked at. Um, so, so mu would, can be zero, which is, I mean, it can't quite be zero. It has to be, it can be up to something like zero, close to zero, but it can be, it can be uh, negative. Okay, so that's all right. So mu negative is fine. Um, this is bad. Okay, we can't have mu greater than zero we get an, uh, a distribution that doesn't look like a, a power law. I mean, it's still, it's still a log normal, it's fine. It's, it is a log normal, and it will truncate. Uh, but it's gonna be a weird, weird one. We'd never confuse it for a power law. Okay, <coughs> so if the variance is large enough, you go back and look at that thing, then we get, yes, again, we get um, gamma is one plus a constant. And you can, you can play around with this and experiment figure out how long you think that scaling is going to hold. Well, it's until the first, that first log x squared term becomes significant compared to the second one. So we could say when it's about 0.05, that's just a rough thing. 10%, 5%, something like that. You can unwrap this guy and we get some estimates. So it depends on sigma squared and mu. So roughly about when log, well, we'll turn into log 10x. When that happens, the whole thing, um, simplifies pretty well. All right, so, yeah. So if you see a minus one exponent coming out of a real thing, it's a bit strange, but you may have something that looks like a log normal. Uh, it's possible you could sneakily get one. The problem, okay, so the problem with mu being less than zero is that it, it connects to something that's not growing. It's de 
it's decreasing. We're, there's no growth in here. Let's get, that's what we're going to get to next. But the problem with that is it, it, it doesn't give you a good model. So let's get our, our model in here to produce a log normal. That's just all descriptive. Random multiplicative uh, growth model. We've had uh, aggregation models, replication models. Right? I've given them different kinds of terms. But this is what this is. Very, very simple. So you should know about this one for sure. So it's simply that xn plus 1 is some random number times the previous guy, right? So this is the size of money in your bank account. is some random amount, random number times what you had before. And it can't be negative. You just have something. You just have some character here that's being um, sampled from a, a distribution that you keep uh, holding. Uh, you can certainly have things shrink. Seinfeld. You can have shrinkage. Um, and what else should I say about this? So they're not in competition either, right? So you've got an X1, and then you let it grow. So this is like the random walk story. You let the thing grow, and you get some size after some time. And then you start with another one, and you let that one grow. And so you're comparing them in a non-competitive way. They've all got their own little growth stories. And you look at the distribution of possible outcomes. So you can think of it like, well, what are the possible values this one character could have in the future? Or you can have an ensemble of them evolving and put them all in a big box. Um, so in log space, we get this. And this is good. And we just take the log of this. This is, this is good because this is now looking like uh, what, uh, the, the kind of simple thing that gives rise to a normal distribution, right? central limit theorem. Essentially, you're taking, ultimately, you go back. You have x1. You're going to add some random thing here. Then you're going to add another one. You're going to add another one another one to get the nth one. Um, so it means that log xn is normally distributed. It's a central limit theorem, as long as this thing isn't too insane. Uh, and therefore, that x is log normally distributed. So that's it. That is the most, that's a very basic story. You have to have, you have to allow for growth. Uh, it's multiplicative growth, and you'll get log normals. Perfect. OK, so there's a little bit of connecting to some other things. So you can go back in time. Um, firm sizes have a, uh, a skewed, a heavy tail distribution. There are arguments about what it is. Uh, this is back in 1931, said it was a, exactly this model, exactly this growth model. Um, and again, giving you that exponent. There's a paper by Axtell in 2001 that gets a parallel fit, again, with firm sizes, but it shows something quite different. And maybe, I'm not sure what your product did. Was it a CCDF problem or something like that? Um, gets gamma equals 2. And here's the actual data. I mean, it's pretty good. This is, this is so firm sizes of size 1 or 2, perhaps. This is, I think self-employed was not counted. That, I think that's a 2. Uh, up to a million people. So this is, a, this is a very broad range. This is good. This is quality scaling, which we'll talk about later on. And here are three, six, nine orders of magnitude here. So that this thing is actually, this is a deceptive looking thing. It's a much steeper uh, slope. Uh, so yeah, so for this six across here, there's roughly 12 uh, orders down here. So it's a minus two. Um, yeah, so, so so one aspect that seems to be okay, and this is why this log normal thing is appealing, is that growth appears to be independent of size, right? So you have your huge firm can grow by 10%, so can your tiny little firm, right? But that's the, that's the, the idea, um, which is a little crazy. All right, this was a science paper. As I said, it was published in Science 2001. Yes. Um, you know. Did a very nice job. I think there's like 100 pages in the supplementary information. But the paper itself is like three pages long, with one graph, probably. Yeah. And so Axel go, you know, really goes into the theory. Uh, you know, if, if you've got something that may be doing this. Um, and why you get a gamma uh, equal 2 rather than this log normal. So here's, and so here's why I'm getting to this, because this is a funny thing to do. Imagine you have n entities, and they're not, they're not competing, but they're interacting in, in a way technically, as I'll explain. So you get your growth, which looks like a log normal. right? This looks, you, if you look at this equation now, you'd say, OK, that's going to produce a log normal distribution. This thing is a random uh, number that's drawn from some distribution such that it's 
greater than zero. Um, it looks like a log normal, but here's the extra, extra piece that's added. You add this one little detail. So uh, that the, the next, so you've, you've got all of these guys. They're not competing, as I said, but they're, they're, they're connected through this. So instead of just being uh, the next size of the firm at the next time, you know, a year later, being some random number multiplied by what it is now, you have that, but you also have that it is the maximum of that potential size and some small constant times the average size now. This is a strange thing. But it puts a floor on it. It says there's a minimum for firm size. So one of the aspects of this is that it can, a firm can become arbitrarily small. This says they're kind of bound together and you can't get anything too small. And you know, firms, of course, if you're talking about one person, two, you have a discrete story there. This isn't discrete, but it's trying to capture that a little bit. So you're taking your log normal and you're just saying, you're not saying there's a fixed wall. The wall depends on the sizes of everything now, but you you're just sort of saying, okay, it can't go any smaller than that. And it's some constant times the average size of firms right now. And that constant is quite small. Okay, so um, I may give you this question. Um, if you fill around with this, you get now instead of a, so this is the thing, that little tweak, that little change that says there's a boundary, that just says it can't be too small, which is a very funny small little change, suddenly gives you a power size distribution. And it gives you one with an exponent that's minus two instead of minus one, which the log normal uh, masks. Um, gamma, the gamma that pops out is sitting in here and if you take uh, C to be very small, um, it's a bit messy, if you take, so you know you have to compute this, you get this mess, if you take C over N to be much less than one, so it's not just C, you can wrap the number in as well, uh, this simplifies, we can do it, I'm not going to say too much, and you can end up with, you'll end up with gamma is about 1 plus 1 over 1 minus C. So there's some small tweak in here. But if C, is, if C is very, very small, then it's 2, right? It's close to 2. Um, and in fact, if C it moves away from 1, then uh, it starts to increase above 2. So that's a strange business. It snaps away, right? If you change the mechanism in this small way, it snaps uh, from a a log normal, which is a fundamentally different kind of distribution, to one that gives you a, one that's a parallel size distribution with a different you know, exponent that's changed by one, which is a huge difference. Really exciting. Okay. Anyway, this is this these this set of slides just show you there are strange things that happen. Let's just do one more change, and um, and that will be good for today. Let's do one more little change here and see what happens to that. So now we've got a I'm going to call it a random growth model. So it looks like the log normal again, and, but variable lifespan, because they all start at the same time in this other one. So let's just give them, let's just say our firms or whatever it is have been alive for different amounts of time. That's all. Right, so the ages are different. They've all started at different points. Uh, and as long, so, but when they start, they get a log normal story as well. Every time they, they start, they get a random growth model applied to them. So here's an example. This is kind of crazy and insane, but it's a very simple one. So we've got an exponential distribution of age. This is totally made up, but, you've just, let's say it's, but it's a simple thing. We've got an exponential distribution of age. Um, and we've gone back to saying, well, there's no limit. We've removed this limit. That was that tiny little limit saying that you can't have firms too small. So now they can become arbitrarily small again. So we're taking the log normal model and all we're doing is we're saying we've got things of different ages. And they've been growing for different amounts of time. So the, the distribution you end up with, it's, it's really the log normal, but now you have to integrate over the different lifespans. So before we had, um, you know, they've, they've lived for a certain amount of time, that's the T. Now we have to integrate over that T to give our distribution at some um, uh, yeah, right, at now, yeah, okay, now, yeah. So we're sort of assuming, yeah, okay, right. The distribution of lifespans is, is, is just this thing that we have, it's fixed. So that's a funny thing to do. We've got our log normal, but we've wrapped around this exponential. 
which looks like a fun integral to do. It's really an insane integral. Um, but let's, it does pop out something quite, quite different. I mean, okay. One of, the, one of the, you know, the most important things about analytic things is you know, there's a limit to what you want to do, right? You, can, you can't have something with 20,000 variables or something. But um, you know, if you get some, rock, some hard results, then you, you kind of have some ground truth. And then when you go off to your simulations, you know, you're simulating fluid flow around a, you know, whatever it is, through a wind farm or through over, um, you know, uh, plain uh, wings and so on, you, you know what you, you're kind of there because you really understand how it goes around a ball. It's not perfect, but you've got to do it right for very simple things. Okay, so now we're going to average these log normal distributions, and I'll tell you what happens. Um, this is the horrible thing. Um, you have to do this, you get lots of suffering, and you end up with, okay, you end up with a lot of suffering, and you end up with uh, this beast, what, and what's it, let me get this right, yeah, so we're going to say mu is log m, right? Mu is log m. Just replace this guy here. So that's the underlying average. Um, and this is a strange thing. There's a square root of a square, which, you know, you should just take the square root, right? But it depends if the thing underneath it that's being squared is positive or negative. Right, so if this was... If this is plus 3 squared, and you take the square root, you get 3. But if it was minus 3 squared, and you take the square root of it, you don't want to put minus 3, because you need to put minus minus 3. So you have to be a little careful with that. So it depends on this thing. And this thing's flip sign, uh, right, log of 1 is 0. So it depends whether x is greater than m or less than m. So when x is greater than m, we, get, we take one sign here. We, we take uh, the positive sign. And when x is less than m, we take the negative sign. So that's strange. Um, this is what I'm rattling on about, right? So depending on, what the, depending on the sign of this thing in here, the log, OK, so if x over m is less than 1, when we take the square root, we need to put a plus. It, it will turn into a plus because we've got a minus here. Uh, if x over m is greater than 1, we end up with a, um, a minus. We just keep the minus sign. So the whole thing is positive. Uh, let's see what it is. It's e to the, right, e to the, let's say, x over m is greater than 1. In that case, you'd put e to the minus, it's the square root. It becomes e to the minus the square root of 2 lambda. That's just some number. And the square root of that thing, log, it's plus, right? It's just a, we leave it as plus, x over m, like this. And this is e, there's a log, and there's a number. Right, so this it turns out to be x over m. e to this is just x over m to the minus root 2 lambda. Hmm. So the, the m doesn't matter, it's a proportionality. Uh, yeah, so we've got x to the minus 1 in both cases. We get a minus root 2 lambda when x is above the mean, um, and an x minus 1 plus root 2 lambda when, when it's less. So this is ridiculous, but it's a break in scaling. It's a harsh break in scaling, right? There are two scaling regimes. It's a very odd thing. It's a very odd thing. Very, very common behavior. You get it. You see it in earthquake distributions. You actually see it in word distributions. Um, so sometimes you'll see double Pareto as the term here. Three is pretty hard to get. Yeah, but maybe not. Uh, famous work by Montreal and uh, Schlesinger uh, behind all of this. And, and this, this particular calculation was actually used by Huberman and Lado Adamic to, uh, to, to, to model the numbers of pages on, I think, is that numbers of pages per website? I thought it was clicks. Huh. Which seems like an odd thing to be able to do, but you, you can do that too. All right. Th these are just three examples, and there's an infinity of things to do here. But the point is, if you just slide the rules around a little bit, you go from a log normal to a power law with a very different exponent. And then to now back to something which is a power law with, with two kinds of scaling, which is strange. OK, so the uh, upshot is log normals and power laws. Just these two characters can look very similar. Um, as we saw, the random multiplicative growth thing, that, you know, really fundamental thing. This is really a central limit theorem in log space. 
Um, it, it's absolutely the central limit theorem. Uh, if you put in a little minimum size, you get a power law suddenly. And if you have no minimum size, but you have a distribution of lifetimes, you can get into double Pareto's. And that was just with an exponential distribution. Funny thing to do. Uh, you need to be careful. That's all I want to say about that. Um, I, think, I think that's it. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to actually talk about emergence a little bit at the start of next week, because that's part of a, the overview at the start. I sort of have left that as we go through the course. Uh, and then we'll start on um, complex networks, actually. So that's, which is fantastic. Fantastic. Really interesting. Super important. And it's what put complex systems onto a hard, solid footwork. Except for the fact that systems exist. You know, that was always true. But, you know, mathematically. Okay. All right, team. Thank you.